code. Let's see. Make you the host. Mm. All right, Marilyn. All right. I just have to get all my buttons pushed. Mm hmm Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, I, Peggy's the one that got in touch with me to, to talk to you guys, and uh, uh, we share some things with her on Facebook. Can you hear me okay? Is it coming through? Yes, absolutely. Can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, and this is the first time I've ever done this, so this is all very interesting. Uh, Anyway, so I, the, the DYCs, you probably heard more colorful language used to describe them than what I'm using. I just said darn yellow uh, composites. But, there, but I found over the years that there's uh, secrets to, to uh, clues to get to use to distinguish among them. I don't get as upset about them as a lot of people I've heard. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years. We moved here 20 years ago, and, and so 20, for 20 years I've been collecting flowers as, as a photographer. I worked as a master naturalist in, in a program here in Kerrville uh, on a virtual herbarium that never got taken off, but as the photographer I collected lots of pictures. Uh, so uh, not all yellow flowers are composites. Uh, there's lots of yellow. These are all flowers from Texas. Uh, and so what makes a flower composite? Well, composite flowers are made up of clusters of little flowers that look like, we call it one flower when, when it's uh, uh, actually many smaller flowers clustered together. So this is kind of a diagram broken down to show what the parts are. Uh, just to show how it is multiple multiple kinds of flowers uh, but we talk we'll be talking about the disc flowers and we'll be talking about the ray flowers which are the ones on the out the what we call petals flower petals uh the and the other thing that we will be talking about some are the filiaries which are the bracts at the at the base of the of the flower uh, I wanted to recommend this book. Uh, it's kind of a lifesaver for me. Uh, it has all the little pictures and terminology. So when I'm reading one of the other books, I can look up a word and, uh, and it gives me the explanation. So I just, uh, I, I've appreciated it's, it's, it being around. There, uh, there's somebody that wants to get admitted, Deb. Uh, so how do I go about distinguishing these people? Uh, they all kind of look alike. That's what people say about it all the time. Just go ahead and admit them. If they have okay. a name attached, yes. go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I, I look at uh, the size of the plant and its growth habit. Uh, so we have you know, a variety of growth habits and, and sizes. Uh, some things like tall and upright, like the sunflower. Uh, the golden eye is a bushy, look, is, is a good sized bush most of the time. Uh, Cretan weed uh, is, uh, it's, it is a, not a native, but I, I, I'll tell you why I appreciate it later. It's very short and flat. And then the bitter weeds are small plants, but they're, they're kind of simple looking. So then you look at those kinds of things. Then I also look at the leaves, which there's the leaf shape. And, and if anybody has any questions or comments to make along the way, just let me know. Uh, and then I look at leaf size. They come in all different sizes and shapes. And, and then I look at color, because sometimes the color really makes a big deal of difference. Blue weed, for instance, or cap and daisy, that, that sheen is really important. Uh, the back side of the golden ground cell uh, is purple when it's, when it's early spring. Uh, look at leaf texture. You have the very rough and the, or the smooth and silky or the 
kind of kind of it's not rough like with hair but it's not not a smooth leaf either so these are all things that that you look for that kind of help you know which direction to go i also look at the size of the flower and so we have a large variety of sizes of flowers that go from uh, ha less than half an inch, which is a straggler daisy or horse herb, I think a lot of people call it, on up to the compass plant, which is over three inches. Uh, so that the size of the flower sometimes is uh, important. And one of the things I discovered not too long back was that uh, just because I had run out of taking pictures of all the fronts of the flowers and I was bored and I needed something else to do, I started flipping the flowers and looking at the backs of flowers. And so these, uh, I found that some, they're, they're very distinctive and uh, some of them are very key in helping you identify what, which one they are. Uh, and we'll look at some of those as we go along. Uh, also look at the color of the disc flower or the disc flowers in the middle. For instance, uh, this is the same, the Helium amaranth and Helium, they're both Helium, Helium amaranth, but one's amaranth, very uh, variety amaranth and the other one's variety vadium. And uh, they bloom close to the same time of the year uh, sometimes not in uh, different areas. I've, I've actually took, I think these, both of these pictures were taken in the very same uh, parking lot uh, in, in Fredericksburg. This, uh, but uh, the Amron has the white, has the golden center and the Badium has the dark center. Uh, also in the green threads, there's two kinds that are both Thelisperum filifolium but the one that's more common down here has the dark center. Uh, up further toward the north, like uh, is Coleman and Taylor County, uh, you can find them with the white, with the golden center. And uh, it's, it's just a, a variation of, of the same plant. Uh, and I looked at the shade of the yellow ray flowers, the petals. Uh, whoops. The the uh, sleepy daisy. Uh, I don't know if you how familiar you are with that one, but it just kind of shines on its own because it's very much of a lemon yellow, uh, and it and it only blooms in the afternoon when the sun's on it, so it just kind of pops. And the zexminia, which tends toward the orange color. I'll, another thing to check for is what it smells like. And so you often tell people to crush the leaves or, you know, check it out, check what the smell, the fragrance or the odor is. Uh, one of them has this well, camphor weed. And needless to say, it smells like camphor, camphor phonique. Uh, and then, then chocolate flower. And it's really cool because it really does smell like chocolate. Uh, it's not one where you have to crush the leaf. This is the smell coming from the flower. So another thing I look at and consider is what kind of soil they're growing in and where, they, where they're growing at, whether it's over by, by uh, in the water or up on a rocky hillside or out in the field. And so those are all key things to look for. So why, 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 why am I going to be using scientific names? Uh, well, it's because common names vary by tradition, location, and what your grandmother called them. And so there gets to be lots of arguments among people about what, what's what because, well, my mother told me it was such and such. Or, and so, uh, so I going by, I include the common names but, that I've seen, uh, but also uh, I pretty much uh, stick to the scientific names. Uh, we're all talking about the same family, uh, the Asteraceae or the composite. Com and then, uh, then the variations are the genuses. This, uh, I learned that or it's genera. Genera is plural for genus. Uh, and then species, 
And then there's some with a subspecies, which is a variety. Uh, there it goes. Uh, so here it, we're going to look at some flower, different plants that they're the same genus. This, in this case, it's the same genus, but a different species. Uh, this is a little, a small little plant that you see on the roadside frequently, uh, almost in the gravel. Uh, and it's, they, this one's called Paralena. So it's Thymophila pen, pentacheta. And uh, here's its cousin, Thymophila tiniloba. And it's pretty much the same. Hard to distinguish between the two unless you really look at the leaves. And the leaves are the things that's going to show the major difference in the two of them. That's, I try to pick the simplest way to tell the difference, not the technical scientific one. Then there's the, this is a, this is a nice, nice little plant that, uh, it's one of the first ones that blooms in the, in the spring. And they're still blooming now. They, they go from being the size of a, oh, a quarter, or maybe, maybe a little bit bigger than a quarter, down to the size of a dime as the season goes on. Uh, it's called, uh, in this case, the slender leaf hymenox. Its cousin, they call it, now I didn't come up with these names, it's called the slender stemmed bitterweed. And uh, the, the, it looks really similar, starts blooming about the same time, but the, the difference is in the growth style. So this, the bitterweed, the slender stem bitterweed, has uh, the, the leaves are at the bottom of the plant with the long, long, uh, long stems for the flower at the top, whereas the slender leaf hymenox has leaves growing up the stem and uh, usually is much smaller plant in general. I've seen some taller ones once in a while, but they have to be very happy and very well watered. Uh, so a similar common name, but a different genus altogether. These are dogweed. This one's called dogweed. And then this one's called prickly leaf dogweed. So what do they have in common? Well, the only thing they have in common is that they have glands on the, on the buds and on the leaves. And you can see the little golden uh, glands of, I don't know what they have in them even. Uh, well, I suppose. Uh, but the flowers are different, the leaves are very different, and the plant growth is very different. But they're both called dogweed. Uh, another one that's the same genus, but, and the flower kind of looks alike, but they're different. So we have the chocolate flower, which we've talked about already. And we have its cousin, the Texas green eyes. The differences are pretty dynamic. They have really different leaves. They have really different growth styles. And if you look at the back of the petals on the flowers, you get a really different uh, perspective. The chocolate kind of seeps out on the chocolate flower. Another one that uh, people get uh, kind of very frustrated or confused with is the cone flowers. Uh, and so we have, I have four different cone flowers represented here. But the, but the two that are the most similar are brown-eyed Susan and the clasping leaf coneflower. And they, to tell the difference between them, you have to feel it. So how do they feel? Is it prickly or smooth? If it's prickly, it's the, the brown-eyed Susan. If it's smooth, it's the clasping leaf coneflower. The other significant thing on these two is how does the leaf attach to the stem? And so if you notice on the brown-eyed Susan, the leaf comes to, come, is finished and then it attaches to the stem. 
whereas the clasping leaf coneflower completely wraps itself around the stem, and which is how it got its name. Uh, threw in the Mexican hat because it is a coneflower and people look at the flower alone and, and get it confused. But the, but the habitat and the leaf and the plant growth and everything is completely different. Sunflowers uh, all look alike or look sim very similar. They all have the same genus, but the leaves are one of the big giveaways. So we have uh, the ones I've chosen have been the common sunflower, the cumber leaf, cucumber leaf sunflower, and the Maximilian sun sunflower. So we have this one that the, 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 the leaves start out very huge at the bottom and get smaller as they go toward the top but still has, and it's pretty good sized plants so in most cases, you, you, they, there's a lot of variety in them. Uh, but they have leaves pretty much going over the stem. The cucumber leaf, however, keeps all the leaves, the leaf growth is at the bottom and they send up stems with, with the flower on top. And so, so it makes it, just when you see them, you see there's a difference, but then, when you look at the leaves is where you see the big difference. Uh, so common sunflower is a little rough and, and large. The cucumber leaf sunflower is shiny. Uh, it's rough textured if you feel it but, it, but in the light it shines. And then of course the Maximilian sunflower has leaves that don't look like anything like a sunflower. They're, they're long and skinny. Uh, oh, I was going to, uh, if you look at the flower up here, uh, the Maximilian sunflower, we're going to be talking about that again in a minute. The silphiums are another really neat uh, flower that I enjoy. They're, they're called rosin weeds. They all have the same genus and they kind of, there's some kind of chunky filiaries that, that make them look a little bit alike but it's the things that are different that tell you really who they are the compass plant is large uh can get like five feet tall and uh it has these leaves that are like third oh i would say anywhere from 15 to 20 inches long uh, and then the rosin, the rough stem rosin weed, uh, the ones I've seen have been something like, like uh, all three feet tall, but all the growth is at the ground level. And then it sends up tall uh, stalks with an individual flower on the end. And then the Simpsons rosin weed, I've seen them over five feet too but they have leaves all the way to the top and then a cluster of the flowers on, on top. So the leaves are one of the big things that difference. It's their size and their shape. The compass plant has these, these that are really cut in. I think they're called compass because, or one of the things they've said is because they, uh, the leaves twist uh, according to well, the earth isn't changing direction, so I don't know why that would have anything to do with a compass. But anyway, they, they do change uh, direction, maybe from the light. Uh, Simpson's rosin weed is very even edged and uh, kind of stiff. Uh, rough, sti rough stem rosin weed, uh, are, they're just uh, more uh, wavy, I guess would be a term for it. I'm not too good with the actual terms of terminologies. I'd only made a D in college bio botany. Anyway, uh, so, so the thing, the thing that's most similar about them is the flower, is something about the flower. And it's that the flower disc has tubular flowers, you can see them down here in this close-up, with elongated styles. Uh, the compass plants are really long, uh, but they all have these long styles that hang out. 
of each little tuber, tubular flower. And so, so here's the Maximilian sunflower again, with a close-up of how its disc flower is uh, in comparison to the rough stemmed rosin leaves flower. And so it just kind of gives you an idea of why that's a significant difference. Uh, the genus Grindelia is, an, is another one that's pretty cool. Uh, the filiaries are, and, are the bracts on the base of the flower are kind of one of the, it has leaves that are different, but that also is a clue to which kind of, which one it is. Uh, and this is a real fun one because I don't, uh, I just, as I was working this up, I have two different names for it and I'm not sure which one it is. But they both have the same feature uh, about, about what the, the filiaries are doing. So it's either squatterosa or nuda, variation nuda, so we'll find out one day. Uh, the, there's fall gum, which is, the, I think, the, most, the largest variety around, and then the saw leaf daisy. Now, here we go. You can really see the difference in the, dif in the filiaries this way. The curly top has the curls. They curve down. The fall gum weed, they all go straight, either out or up. And then the saw leaf, they're flattened. The others have like, they're like, like little fingers, they're round, but the saw leaves are flattened. And so that, that really helps in, in distinguishing them all. So this is a famous one, group of flowers. Uh, this batch of flowers all look alike. There's several different genuses and and are, uh, what is it, generis, and they vary in size from half an inch to three inch. There's also several of them that are um, people do not like because they are uh, invasive, exotic invasives. Uh, so they get fought a lot in people's yards. The bad thing is that they sometimes don't know the difference and they kill off the the neat native ones. So some, the, some of the natives ones, we're gonna start with the little bitty ones. The dwarf dandelion, and you can see my finger there, that's what I use to measure things by when I'm out taking pictures. Uh, so I have the dwarf dandelion showing you the size of the flower. This is its, uh, uh, its cousin, another <laughs> Krigia. <laughs> And my dog just got excited. Uh, the and it it's it has just a different look from the other one. You can also see how the plant growth is different because it has long, the flower heads are on long, tall, uh, upright uh, stems. Then then this is uh, the famous Texas dandelion. It grows. It's the one that really gets eradicated people thinking of their, it's the other dandelion, the common dandelion, because it grows about the same time. It uh, has the same kind of seed head and it's yellow. And so people try to get rid of it. But uh, it does have a lot of variation in the flowers, uh, but, uh, but it, it is a native text. There's also it's the Texas giant Texas dandelion, and I haven't seen very many of these, but they, they, but it was it was quite a bit taller, and the bloom was quite a bit bigger than than the the one that grows around here. This was up near up near Brady, I think. Uh, so there's so the, but these are the ones that they get mixed up with, and they start trying to get rid of. This is a south thistle. This is this this is one I really like. Uh, it people really don't like it. I mean, not, lots of people don't like it. It it you can mow it and it blooms and it's really great. Uh, but uh, one of the things that it features, I just when I was trying to identify it, was I noticed it had the black fringe on the petals, that makes it really distinctive. Even even the bu flower bud has little black fringe 
on the panels. And uh, I believe it was uh, Bill Carr that tell, gave me the key on that one. Uh, so there are our common dandelion, and that's also another favorite of mine because it's the first and only flower that people tell their children to pick all the flowers they want, and kids get to learn to appreciate what flowers are by dandelions. Nothing, they won't let them touch the others, but you can pick all the dandelions you want. Uh, plus, uh, there's some people that eat them, I think. Uh, and this is a People don't like this, and I'm, I, uh, where I live uh, here in Kerrville, we don't have enough good dirt for things to get too invasive, except for a couple of uh, trees. And so, uh, you know, there's, they're scattered around, so that's not, I don't, that my experience hasn't been that they much of a problem. But anyway, it's the goat's beard, and it has this huge uh, puff ball when, when it, in seed pod. So again, uh, same genus, but it, ha it produces two different kinds of bushes. Uh, for instance, this one's very compact and tight, and this one's very loose and, and kind of spraggly. Uh, so we have the golden eye, uh, which is, is, is a really pretty little bush. And then we have the skeleton leaf golden eye. And they have very different leaves, and that's kind of what the clue is. You have the growth habit, but then you have the leaves that are, are really distinctive. Uh, this flower was not known to me at first. I've only seen it once, and that was south of San Antonio. And uh, on, a, on a wildflower spring trip, uh, but I noticed they had something similar to the square bud daisy, which, of which I'm very familiar with. And so, there it goes. Uh, so the square bud daisy has one of the key features is that it's got this bud that's in four parts. Did you ever play that game where you do the, the fortune telling game as a kid? That's what it reminds me of. Anyway, uh, and, and even the, the stems and leaves are, are in four, kind of, you can see four leaves going off on this one. So this one did too. This one had the bud that had the four leaves, the four, four parts to it, and they open up to form a four-pointed a four backing for the flower, and so they're they're they they're they're cousins. I discovered this the other day. There's a non-composite that had an inch, a similar looking uh, backing, but this one's got five points instead of four. It's a spreading seda, and much smaller. The Thelosperma genus which is our, our native green thread, uh, has filiaries in two series, and I have them marked here. Uh, the bottom one is kind of blended into the, into the stem, and then it has another one that goes up around the flower parts. Uh, so the, there's four varieties of green uh, thelospermas that I'm familiar with. And so we have the regular green thread, which is one of my, I really like that flower, and the Navajo tea, which is, a, which is similar, but it doesn't have, it has, uh, again, doesn't have the brown center. Uh, to the north, we have stiff green thread, which is the name I found for it anyway, and it's the one that doesn't have, that also doesn't have the dark center. And then the rayless green thread, which is more to the west. Uh, and so here you can see, see the, the, the similarity in the bases. And that gives you a hint on how to go about uh, where to go to look when you want to look for a flower. I, I threw this in. This is uh, 
the uh, uh, the base of a, rig, a green thread, but when after it's been pollinated and gone working on go, building seeds, and so it make, turns into a ball. Uh, here it's just the bud fixing to open. I thought that was interesting. Uh, these are two different genera, and they're often confused in the spring. And uh, at least around here anyway, uh, both can cover large fields in yellow. And one of them is the one we've been talking about, which is the green thread itself. And uh, the, it often gets mixed in with, uh, with the uh, Indian blankets, uh, but they just have whole fields of them. But a little earlier in the season, the basin sneezeweed can do the same thing. And it can feel just, I know up on Willow City Loop, uh, the basin sneezeweed, there's a lot more of it than there are of, uh, of green thread. And you can, they look kind of similar and they do, you know, they cover, and when you're just driving by, you see the yellow flower with the brown center. So but you have to flip them over and look at the back. And the basin sneezeweed's backing is totally different. So it really gives you a different concept of, of, of that flower. And sometimes I can tell the difference in flowers by, the, by the, what season they're blooming in. So the basin sneezeweed is a spring flower. Its cousin, the, the bitter sneezeweed, is also a spring flower. Another cousin, just, and it just has the plain word sneezeweed, uh, is more of a summer, and it has wings on the stem. And that, that's a real uh, distinguishing aspect of it. It, uh, it also, you can see different colors of the flowers or have a variety. And the sh then there's the showy sneezeweed, which happens to be a whole lot smaller than the others for some reason. I don't know why it's considered uh, showy. <laughs> it confused me for a long time. But uh, uh, it, it has a different growth habit. You notice that it's like one plant. This is one plant. It grows up and then has a bunch of little flowers spr sprinkled around on it. Whereas the... Uh, this one is, is, tends to be singular plants, and then they have a, a few flowers at the top. And then in the fall, there's the fall sneezeweed, which grows close to the water, and it has, it has much showier flowers. They're, they're fairly large yellow flowers. And if you look, the stems have very little uh, wings on them. They're, they also have wings. Another one that, this is one of my favorites, maybe because it's the easiest one to grow on my property, is the cowpin daisy. Uh, I have a whole field of them if I don't mow, mow it down yet. I, I mow in pieces and so there's I have clumps of flowers here and there. Uh, so it, but it blooms in the spring, the summer, and the fall. It depends on rain. Uh, when it, it can come back several times. Uh, its cousin, Crown, Lindheimer's crown beard, ah, that goes with you guys, uh, is, is a fall bloomer and the flower is much bigger. And it has really, really rough leaves. It's a very interesting plant. It doesn't look like the other one at all. This I threw in, I just took it not too long back. Uh, on August 23rd, we hadn't had rain for about four weeks, and the, the, the cowpin daisies just kind of shriveled up and turned blue, gray. And five days after rain, it completely filled out, was growing again and happy, and now it's got lots more flowers than it did then. So it's just, it's, I, it's, I like it because it, like it it's easy. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the seasonal favorite uh, golden rods. And uh, I distinguish them mostly by their leaves and location. So the tall golden rod, or altissima, that means tall, uh, grows in caliche dirt 
more on the dry land, more up on, up on the dry slopes. Uh, and you'll notice a little bit of red on the stem and notice how the leaves are going up the stems. That's real significant to distinguish it. And then the giant goldenrod is one that grows down in the water areas, down on the swamp, swampy places, on creek beds, on river beds, but it likes to have its feet very close to the water. And uh, it, has, it has enough, uh, uh, oh, there. it turns, it's silvery gray. The stems are silvery gray, the leaves are silvery gray, and that's a distinguishing thing, and very large. Then there's the prairie goldenrod, around here anyway, I don't know whether it goes down your way, uh, that grows on caliche rocky sides, and uh, it has different sized leaves on the stem. Uh, and it's only about, oh, I guess the tallest is 24 inches. And then there's the downy goldenrod, and uh, it has a different kind of leaf. And <laughs> it's kind of a cheat because I have never seen this one growing in the wild. It has, it's been, a, they have it in all the nature center and the butterfly garden and all sorts of places here in Kerrville. And so that's where I got the pictures of, and I have yet to find exactly where uh, what what the book says about where they grow. But uh, the leaves are di really distinctive on these, th these guys, and they're real distinctive on helping identify which kind they are. Different, sh they're all, they're alternate leaves, but they kind of have a different arrangement of how they do, how they, whether they're growing up or down or out or around. So the things I look for, are the size of the plant and its growth habit, the, the leaves, shape, size, color, and texture, the size of the flower, the back side of the flower, the color of the center disc, the shade of yellow rays, the smells, and its location. So those are the kind of the things that I've that I use to uh, to help me uh, figure it all out. And I, I have to say, I am not, I am not, uh, I'm not a professional, and I, this is all stuff I dig out of different books. These are just a few of the books I have collected over the years. Uh, that's only two of the shelves, and I've got five shelves. So, anyway, uh, and and then I use a few sites on the computer, uh, the Ladybird Nature Center database, the USDA plant data, uh, and uh, then I post on Facebook and have some of my, uh, some friends that are experts and have trained uh, botanical experience uh, correct me on a lot of things. So, so those are my sources of information. And I thank you for letting me share. I appreciate it. Any questions out there or, or I was looking at the clock. I think I'm good. Questions on the uh, flowers or on marriage? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's we'll what you have plans. to do personally. Let's not do that in, in public. That was uh, really good. I, I got more understanding of those dang little yellow flowers. Um, <laughs> They're everywhere, but they really are difficult to identify. Uh, those were some really helpful hints. Thank well, good, good. I'm glad I it, helped. Uh, it it's taken a while. It doesn't. It didn't happen overnight. Anybody else? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. No. Well, <laughs> good. Uh, well, Marilyn, Marilyn, we, yeah, thank you. I see several notes coming in, uh, chats about thanking you. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise on this. It's a very confounding <laughs> um, area to study. So um, hopefully everybody learned a couple new um, of their yellow composites.
And then yeah, you we'll, have it recorded so they can look at it again. Yes, so we will be posting that and um, yeah, it will be available for anybody that wasn't able to watch tonight and to watch a second time if you're trying to get out there and, and learn a little bit. So uh, yeah, anyway, thank you so very much, Marilyn. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Um, and since uh, I'll just go ahead and, and let you keep the, the host, if you want to go ahead and um, end the meeting, I think every, I think we're pretty much done for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to unshare, I don't know if anybody had any other comments they wanted to make to anybody else while we're online. <clears throat> um, mm. But uh, everybody stay safe and yeah, hopefully one day in the not too distant future, we'll actually be able to get together a little bit and uh, see each other for reals, but at least this helps. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, Marilyn, if you want to uh, click end the meeting, um, I will. Oh, I will stop the recording. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <clears throat> Bye, guys. End. Thanks, Marilyn. <laughs>